Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, April 21st, and I wanted to start today's screencast on our distance learning schedule. You guys have access to this document, and I hope that you are using it to keep track of your daily tasks, as well as to look uh, ahead for when assignments are due. So today being Tuesday, we're going to do page 14 that compares European and Japanese feudalism. And below this post on Classroom, I also have your review questions on a Google form that covers the last couple of pages, all of Japanese feudalism and today's that compares it to European feudalism. So that assignment will be posted for you today, um, but it is not due until the end of tomorrow. I'll give you some time to make sure that you look over the last couple pages, make sure that you have everything complete before you tackle that task. Okay, so let's jump over to our packet. So we are on page 14, and let's read the, dire the directions at the top of the page. Using what we've learned over the last couple days, complete the tables below comparing the two feudal systems. So on the left, we have the hierarchy triangle of the European feudal system. And on the right, we have the pagoda style um, hierarchy. The architecture of the roof there is the pagoda style. Um, this is the Japanese feudal system. So to start, I'm going to go over these with you. Um, you can kind of flip back through your pages uh, if you want, and you can pause this video at any point in time, but I'm just going to lay out some of the um, elements of each European and Japanese feudalism, and then we'll compare and find some similarities in the middle. And to do this for you, of course, I'm going to go to my slide so that we can pop some information into the boxes. All right, so let's start on the left side with European feudalism. The first thing that I wanna point out that's very unique to only European feudalism is that the peasants, also called serfs, are the lowest class. Peasants and serfs, they're two different terms, but they're very similar. They're almost the same type of person. Peasants were the people who farmed the land, who worked the land for the knights and all the higher lords above them. And a serf, is also a peasant, but they're a little more unique. If you were a serf in the Middle Ages in Europe, you were bound to the land. You were tied to the land by a contract. Um, you're not allowed to leave the manor. And you were you know, pretty much forced to live on that same community, same piece of land for your entire life. Regular peasants who were not serfs, they were not bound to the land. They had a little bit more, uh, more mobility as far as where they could go not up and down the social hi hierarchy, but they could move to a different manor, a different kingdom if they wanted to, and try to you know, make a, another life or work on someone else's um, land in a different place. So serfs were only bound to the land, tied to the land. And they make up the lowest class of European feudalism. Kings in Europe had all of the power. They owned all the land in the country, made the laws, they would give an area of land called a fief to rich lords and nobles, their vassals below them. But they are the ones in Europe who have the ruling power. We'll see how that's a little bit different in Japanese feudalism. In European feudalism, the Pope, leader of the Christian church at the time, held lots of power and influence over society. They also owned a lot of land Peasants and even the nobility also had to pay um, taxes called a tithe to the church. Sometimes that was in actual money. Other times that was in pieces of land, animals, food. So the, uh, the church at this time was incredibly powerful and incredibly wealthy. They also owned a lot of land um, in and throughout Europe. We'll see how the church also is very, very influential in how people react to um, and deal with the Black Plague coming up later this week. In Europe, the people living in the, middle, in the Middle Ages turned to the church for almost everything, for answers, for hope, uh, for their education, if they were able to get any of that at all. The church was very, very powerful. And lastly, in European feudalism, women were considered weak and fragile, that they needed protecting. And this was a value that was kind of 
unofficially written because the Code of uh, Chivalry was not an official document, but it was something that was present in the Code of Chivalry. Knights looked at women as somebody that they should serve and protect, that they should um, you know, treat very, very specially, um, and also try to keep them um, out of danger and help them whenever possible. So let's jump over to Japanese feudalism, and we'll do a comparison in the middle last. The lowest class in Japanese feudalism were the merchants. Notice how they're just a little bit lower under this last little pagoda roof level of the Japanese hierarchy. Peasants, merchants, and artisans are all kind of considered you know, in that lower class, but the merchants were even lower status than peasants and artisans. Remember yesterday we said that merchants did not produce, they didn't make anything with their own hands. So in Japanese culture, they were looked upon as a little bit of a less status because peasants are farming, they're working with their hands, producing something, and artisans are crafting um, all kinds of things, especially swords and armor for the samurai class. So they're producing something too. Merchants uh, did not have much of that status because they produced nothing on their own. They just bought and sold other people's items and tried to profit off of other people's work. So merchants are the lowest class, class in Japanese feudalism. The emperors at the very top of Japanese feudalism, these were figureheads. They were rulers, but they had very little actual power to rule. We'll find out that the shoguns are the actual rulers. They have most of the power. A figurehead is just a symbol. It's a ceremonial position. Um, they were certainly respected and had a lot of wealth, but they didn't make a lot of the actual decisions to rule over Japan. And in Japanese feudalism, there is no one religious organization that influenced society alone. Like over here in European feudalism, the Christian church had an incredible amount of influence and power over people and their lives. But in Japan, there's multiple different religious organizations that had influence. Confucianism had traveled to Japan from China, as did Buddhism. And there's also other Japanese religions like Shintoism, which is, excuse me, which is kind of like a, um, you know, powers and spirits of nature and ancestral values that's worked into um, an ancient religion called Shintoism. So there's multiple religions in Japan that all kind of influence um, different people based on who believed what in Japan. And lastly, women were expected to be tough. They could actually become samurai in Japan. You could have female samurai warriors. But just like um, Sparta, the city-state in Greece, women were expected to be very tough especially if they were in, you know, married to a daimo or a samurai, kind of the noble warrior classes. So that gives us a little breakdown of the specifics for European and Japanese feudalism. Now let's look at how some of these uh, cross over and how they are similar. The first thing I want you to put in similarities is that both of these ideas of feudalism, even though they have some things that are unique, they're both examples of a decentralized government. This is the effect, this is the result of what is happening after big empires and large governments have fallen. In Europe, that large government that had declined and fell was the Roman Empire. It controlled most of Europe as well as parts of Africa and the Middle East. And after Rome falls, a lot, a lot of these people living there do not have the uh, laws and the protection of the army that the Roman government provided. So this idea of feudalism sets up a new system of organization to try to pro uh, provide some stability, some order, now that Rome is gone. A similar occurrence happens in Japan. There was an empire of Japan where an emperor did rule and had control over all the regions of Japan. But as that centralized government declined and fell, Japan needed to go to a similar feudal setup where now the shoguns uh, are the actual rulers. They have control over different regions in Japan. The interesting thing though is that they kept the tradition of the emperor, although 
as we said before, they were just figureheads. They took away a lot of the actual power and decision-making uh, power from the emperor. But both are examples of a decentralized government. And both feudal systems are an exchange of loyalty and service. There's not a lot of uh, social mobility in either of these systems. People are not going from one class to the next. They also are not using money all that often, especially the majority of the population in the lower classes. They are exchanging services or food and their loyalty for protection or for land from the upper classes. So if you compare some of these classes, you look at these different levels across both hierarchy systems, there's a lot in common. First off, kings over here in Europe, they are the actual rulers, the highest position on the European feudal system. They are pretty much the same as the shoguns, the actual rulers that are in the second class over here in Japanese feudalism. Lords, the second uh, class in European feudalism, would be the same as a large landowner, the daimos in Japanese feudalism. And of course, the knights are the warrior class in Europe. They are very similar to the samurai, the warrior class in Japanese feudalism. The peasants on the bottom are the farmers working the land. That's the same case in both. And in both classes, warriors were respected. The code of chivalry and knights in Europe demanded respect from women from the lower classes. Every you know, peasant and serf young boy dreamed of growing up to be a knight in shining, shining armor if he was lucky enough to get um, a position as a, a page or a squire. Maybe someday he could move up the social hierarchy ladder and become a knight. That was one of the only pipe dreams, the only ways that maybe somebody could improve their life. And in Japanese feudalism, the samurai also demanded respect um, in a couple of different ways. First, we look at the artisans. An artisan would have been honored to make swords and armor for the samurais above them. And remember that kind of crazy but interesting fact we read about a few days ago? That all of the lower classes, peasants, artisans, and merchants, were required to bow to a passing by samurai. And if they didn't, remember what happened? The samurai, if they wanted to, were legally entitled to chop off the head of that disrespecting lower class person. Kind of interesting, kind of bizarre, but it definitely demanded the respect that they got from everybody. All right, everyone, that takes care of our page 14 for today. We looked at some elements of feudalism in Europe, some elements of feudalism in Japan, those things that are unique to each one. And we found some things that are um, that they have in common that are similar. So keep these notes handy for your Google form review questions that are posted on the separate post below the one that has this screencast in it. That is due again as a reminder um, at the end of tomorrow, end of Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Email me with any questions and I hope you are staying safe and healthy. Have a great day.